Hello and good morning. Wendy Olson here at the University of Manchester. I'm so pleased to summarize association rules in this video. It's a fairly short video going quickly through some PowerPoint slides, but the workshop has empirical examples in more detail and there is code on my website. I'm just going to run through what is association rules. So I'll share my screen and you'll be able to see these PowerPoint slides. And I will uh, first of all thank the hosts, which is the National Center for Research Methods, who are running the Research Methods e-festival. Um, it's based in the UK, but open worldwide. And everybody's very, very welcome to send questions to my email address. So I hope now you're seeing slide two, the overview. And the overview is that I'll first introduce some terminology. This terminology is somewhat specific to market research as a subdiscipline of business, but we're going to apply that to social science themes. In the middle of the presentation, I'll go into some advanced forms of description. Um, it, these are arising from the customer database, but they can be applied to social science questionnaire surveys. And in the concluding part, I'll talk more about causality and the empirical examples, especially in the workshop, giving references. Great, so here we go. We're ready to move to slide three. The, chi the key textbook is by Chapman and Fight. They've published this with Springer. It's called R for Marketing Research and Analytics. And the key R commands in this book include correlation. So correlation, of course, is a typical statistical method. But here it gets developed in chapters late in the book, including 12 and 16. It's evolved into the association rules commands a priori and a rules. And there is a visualization shown in this book called A Rules Viz. So I have references in the very last slide for how to use A Rules Viz. It goes slightly beyond what this introductory workshop covers. So I'll move on, but we thank um, Chris Chapman and Elia Feit because the textbook is really good. We've been using it at the University of Manchester. Definitions first then, association rules. Well, it's a terminology coming from data mining as a broader school of thought. And data mining is exploratory. So we use exploratory methods in order to quickly summarize a big database. And it isn't really based on a, a close reading of the literature. It's much more about here we have the data, what are we gonna do with it? What can we do fairly quickly? So in consumer expenditure research, we sometimes receive a database with the whole household's employment uh, background, perhaps covering one year and then their expenditures covering 30 days and certain expenditures perhaps covering uh, one year for consumer durables or one day for something that's much more frequent. And we, we get this data coming in fast and it's a very large data set. So association rules is a way to derive rules that help predict the consumer's next step. And that could be applied to diverse contexts, including web page visits. So instead of paying for the products, as a transaction, they might just be visiting the web page, starting with the home page, and then moving to some other pages through clicking. And we record this movement and this sequence, and then we can look at what is the pattern of the sequence. And yet it's not sequence analysis. So association rules just tell us what is associated with what else in the database. So in defining these terms, the statisticians have decided it's best to use the word confidence in a different way, not the typical statistical confidence concept. And so confidence is going to be defined carefully after support is defined. And again, support has its own meaning. So support here refers to the number of cases that are consistent with a particular rule or a pattern of expenditure. Um, if I was buying computers, then it could be that I buy either a computer or an iPad or a, a tablet, let's say. And um, defining it that way using or creates a set of items. And the support for that set of items is how many times I've bought anything in that set or all of that set. So you have to be really explicit about what support means. You sort of have to define that as you go along in the project. So data mining is a project-based activity, and it's not so much based just on the literature and past research and hypothesis testing. It's not like that. If you choose a single product, it could be that support would be the percent of the transactions that include that product. So the transactions could have many other things in them besides that product. You could say that e e support only refers to um, the purchase of two items at one time or three items at one time. We're going to call that an item set. 
So here I go with some terminology. Um, I would note, though, that in the book, we refer to a Belgium groceries data set that's available on the web. Many people have analyzed the Belgium data set, uh, but it does lack social groups. And so instead, you, you have to work out a customer ID number. So, you know, you could have a summary of the postcodes or the date and the exact time of the transactions or um, simple customer IDs. But if you have customer ideas, um, IDs from another database and you can merge those databases, then you might know whether the customer is a regular or an irregular visitor. And if they are regular, it might affect the spending pattern. So you can start to develop a sort of causal prediction of the consumption outcome based on this regularity of the visits, similarly with past spending. So customer databases are not the same as transaction databases, but the manager of a data mining project might want to merge them and they might regularly merge them, you know, every month or so, keep, keep checking and then update the findings of the association uh, project. The second database, database available is about transactions between two businesses, so from business to business. These are sort of gift sets, um, so things like winter blankets or a little gift that you would give to somebody of a candle. And there are thousands of them in the database, and it has the zip code of the buyers. And they, uh, they've made the zip codes anonymous for the use online by other users for this database, but still have a unique transaction ID, which is really important in order to keep your data you know, straight. So those are the two examples that are used in the book by Chapman and Pied. So here are the key definitions now in a slightly more detailed way. Support is the amount people spend on the item set. So I've just deviated. First, I said it was the percentage of people who buy that product. Now I'm saying it's the amount of money they spend, or it could be that that would be the percentage of the money that was spent on that. So it's up to you to decide this. It's what I call an expert subjective decision in data mining. We do have to make subjective decisions, which have you know, a reference point in the objective world. So, for example, how many transactions are in the data set that include the items, barbecue tongs and fire lighters, or you might want to include charcoal in your list. So then your item set would have three items and you would require for something to qualify for support that they, they had bought all three of those. If you wanted to use the term or and to say that they could have bought any one of those, that's another way of specifying the problem. But it's not usually the way that's used here. So in English, we would say and, so barbecue tongs and fire lighters. And that refers to the set of transactions that have both barbecue tongs and fire lighters. And that then would be used as a precursor or predictor of the outcome. So using a single item is a simpler form of this question about support. So support is being operationalized by the market research or by the expert who's doing data mining. Internal customer data is the classic application of this. And CRM refers to customer research management system and co oh, sorry, customer relationship management system. And the customer relationship management system includes the customer database, but it also includes the transaction database. On the other hand, if you're in social science, population experts might use the census, you know, and get the actual census data as anonymized records, or they might have aggregated local data from the census, or they might use a consumer expenditure survey. So I'm looking at how to apply the term support in a much broader context and still be able to take advantage of the mathematics of association rules. So let us define the notation for association rules using this arrow. X implies Y would be an association rule between X and Y, where X is an item set, as I just defined and, and applied that word. Um, and Y would be a smaller item set. Typically, Y would just be one thing, but these must not be empty. So it's no good having X empty to predict Y. It's no good having Y empty as the predicted outcome. So X could be tongs and Y could be charcoal, or X could be tongs and charcoal, and then perhaps Y would be lighter fluid. And we we seem to be making an arbitrary decision about what is on the right and what is on the left of the association rule. But when you're actually working in a company, it's not arbitrary because you have objectives. As a company, you might need to know where to place the most expensive item or the highest profit rate item. Would you place that near the near the charcoal or would you place it near the lighter fluid aisle? 
Would you place it at the beginning of the customer visit or at the end of the customer visit? Well, it depends on these associations. So why typically is a single item such as a portable barbecue that might have a high price and a high profit rate? But the profit rate typically is not the support level. The support refers more to the turnover associated with the item. So we can apply this conceptual framework to social science questions as well. We can have as X the social structural and long-term group memberships, like occupational group that the person is in. And here we would have the person as a line in the data set, and then their spouse might be the next line and a child the next line, and then move to the next household. So we can have marriage status, household size in rooms, uh, simple measurements, but they're good predictors of certain outcomes. And so while the consumer expenditure data sets have quite a limited width in terms of the number of questions or variables, they do have these key indicators like how many rooms are in the household because they're really easy to ask about instead of having asset values or car ownership. And um, we wanna use simple indicators to predict why. So then why could be any mixture of consumer activities. For example, at the moment, we might want to ask about how much have you used artificial intelligence? Have you used ChatGPT? Have you used a computer? Do you go on the internet? Do you have access to the internet via a mobile phone? And some mixture of these things could be why. So why would still be an item set, but it's almost a set of activities. And we write a small routine using and and or to set up why. So that's fairly easy in any software package like Stata or SPSS. We don't have to use R. The next term is confidence. The term confidence has a special meaning here. It is the degree of confidence that they that if they bought X, they would also buy Y so that we could perhaps sell Y to more people in that transaction. And we say that it's the ratio of the support for the union of X and Y divided by the support for X. But this U for union, which seems to refer to in uh, yeah, the union usually means or in English, it actually means a required union of both the presence of all of X and all of Y. So this is because X and Y are item sets. So this intersection involves requiring all of both item sets to be present. So confidence here as written is equivalent to the conditional probability of Y given X. So sort of if X, then Y, but it's much more specific and detailed than the word if. There's another term used in this literature, and that is lift. Lift is symmetric between X and Y, whereas confidence was asymmetric with X predicting Y. So they created the term lift to help us discern between all the association rules that qualify under confidence, we can pick the ones with the highest lift. And lift is defined with this equation. Look at the bottom. The lift of the rule that X predicts Y is the ratio of the support for X union Y divided by the support for X multiplied by support for Y. So looking at bullet point two, lift is defined as the adjusted joint support for the transaction set of X combined with Y. And it's an adjusted number. This number can go toward infinity, this lift number, whereas confidence cannot reach infinity. It just goes between zero and one. So lift is, is proved a little bit helpful in market research. I would say that confidence is more popular um, and then you might use um, some sort of classification system to look at all the different rules. The rules that we discern when we get the computer to give us the list of all the rules that qualify, the rules are quite numerous. And so some of them are quite similar to each other. So you know we can look at examples to sort of work our way through that. If you think about a grocery basket, there might be a lot of people who are buying vegetables, you know, so the vegetable rules tend to be similar. And then only a few people buying barbecue equipment or barbecue inputs. So that's much more rare. Um, so this is how the, the terminology and the mathematics were developed is in the context of this really big basket of possible purchases. The grocery store might have 900 products in it. And the individual transactions are very, very numerous, and you can buy more than one of each product. So it's not just the price that affects the support. Support could be oper operationalized using the quantity that were sold of each of those products in each item set. 
or you might look at profit, which is here called margin. So you, we can almost say that we could have weights on the rows in the database in order to operationalize support. What I'm gonna do, I'm just going to highlight my slide to show you where I am. Support could be operationalized in at least four different ways, price, quantity, margins or profits, profitability of each item, or you can simply conglomerate all those into some weights. And so this is really a business school application. It's actually taught um, rather rarely because it gets so complicated so quickly, so sophisticated. So that's the data mining. And in that context, Lyft is defined as a joint support for X and Y. So we have Lyft, but it doesn't tell us which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, and confidence has this special meaning that it's the degree of confidence or um, I would prefer to say a probability that if they bought X, then they're likely to go ahead and buy Y. So in defining confidence, we only divide by the support for X, but in defining lift, we divide by the support for X and Y. So clearly here, support has to be defined in a way that's consistent between these two things. So if X has social groups, then Y may also include something about social groups. Um, the units have to be somehow similar. So you might prefer a unit free measure of support. So instead of rupees in Indian currency, we could have the percentage of the consumer budget which was spent on Y. And that, that might make it comparable. So we've clarified our terms. Now the units of these terms. Support is usually measured as a ratio or a percent or a count. Confidence is between zero and one, as well as support is. And lift runs along all the positive numbers. So you can have infinite lift if both X and Y are very rare and they're highly correlated. Lift would be very small, it would be around one if they're not correlated and between zero and one if the joint outcome is more rare than even odds. So an example of that might be milk and cigarettes. So people that buy milk may not be buying cigarettes. People that buy cigarettes are more likely to buy lighter fluid but not milk. Um, in a typical Western consumer basket. There is a graphical approach, but it's very tricky. So on my left, I have the graph showing the item sets X and Y. So say X is milk, eggs, and vegetables. Y is cigarettes, lighters, and matches, let's say. So the key assumption is that X is disjoint from Y. They must not overlap. But when we get to looking at the transaction sets or the transactions in the list of transactions, the customers can overlap in what they buy. So it gets confusing. So we call it um, transaction A compared with transaction B and A can include X or Y or lots of other things. So this single Venn diagram PowerPoint slide actually illustrates an ontological difference. On the left, we have item sets and on the right, we have transactions. So here A and B overlap, and B might include item set Y, and then we have to consider what, what's the definition that we're using to measure this overlap or the um, conjoint nature of A and B. And, we, and it's better really not to use the Venn diagram because it is very confusing. But then if you don't have that, you need subscripts. So in this slide, I have used subscripts to help with this explosive data set size. So we could have M sub, sub I to represent the item sets and compare that with M sub J. There is a square transactions data set. Um, that would be where we take all the ABC purchases and people can have multiple A's and multiple B's and multiple C's. And each permutation is unique, but there may be multiple um, copies of a permutation in the transactions data set. But you can then produce a square matrix that shows for every item, which transaction it's in and how many transactions it is in alongside the other items. So this could be called the transactions data set and it may be quite sparse with a lot of zeros. Sparseness makes it very difficult to use regression. Even correlation starts to break down. And this is the reason for data mining being superior to the typical regression that's used in social science. So be prepared in, a, in the workshop, there's gonna be a question about this, a sort of discussion question. Two examples of association rules. It, using India consumer expenditure data, we looked at weddings and jewelry. And for weddings, there was a purchase called the wedding hall booking. It was a service purchase and it covered the last 365 days. 
So another possible predictor of the wedding hall booking is buying an overnight hotel. The reason for this being a predictor is they go to hotel lodgings to visit the relatives that they're going to get married to. And the families are doing this across you know, different generations. So it takes a few visits. So if they have bought hotels, then they're more likely in the future to buy a wedding hall booking. Um, I don't think it works the other way, but it might, that Y might predict X here. So the data miner has to think about which way causality runs. And we call this the structural factors that predict Y. Um, we could say maybe if they're in a certain cast, then that might predict Pundle and hotels jointly. So X and Y would be on the right, sorry, Pundles and hotels would be in Y on the right, and perhaps cast and asset group size or household size could be on the left as X. So you do have to be very cautious about causality when you're interpreting the results. Um, there is a link here to the data set that we used, and we're happy to share the code that we used for um, making that data set easy to use. Exploratory methods are different from regression methods. So in the blue box, I've mentioned about the sparse data. This data from India is very, very sparse, even in the original person-wise list of the expenditure data. So we use the a priori command in R. I don't have a corresponding command in this data. In SPSS, it could be Clementine. Um, and we see which rules emerge as the most strongly predictive. And we can use a mixture of lift and confidence. So we set thresholds for these, um, like 0.05, perhaps 5%. We do have to set a threshold for support before we can even start on the lift uh, and confidence rules. And again, 5% might be a good starting point. But it is an area of subjective decision making about the thresholds. So notice here in the original data set, the Y are in rupees and they're highly skewed. So it may be better to convert that to a binary. The binary is, did they spend any money on weddings? Yes or no. And only 3% or something spent any money on weddings. This conversion can take time, slow you down, limit the benefits of data mining, and might suggest that we could use regression just as quickly because we have to do all this cleaning and checking. Um, this slide summarizes the R command, A rules and A rules viz. Um, in a workshop style, we can go into how to calculate all these standardized measures, maybe convert and normalize the data, um, and perhaps even how to use SPSS Clementine. But if I was using a different method, not data mining, I would use Poisson regression. That is more suitable perhaps for a rare event but that's not the same as data mining. So data mining is defined as exploratory methods which quickly go through a big database and summarize and give a list of the top rules or the top um, associations in that database. So here's the buzz question. Suppose you have some transactions data, would it be quick? You know, would X predict Y or would it be chicken and egg situation? And would you want the social group information? Would you use that? Or another buzz question, if you needed to state an association rule, which association would you be looking for? You know, do you know in advance which are the associations you want, X and Y, or do you just put the whole database in and say, which are the biggest associations? That does prove difficult, but please discuss that. And if so, how would you deal with missing values and zero values? So I'll just, you know, you can pause the recording if you want to run through that buzz question. So you've had to think about this. Um, if you chose to look at social groups, then one of the simplest ways is to look at what industry people are working in. You could pick just one individual or all individuals in the household, look at their industry, like whether they work in manufacturing or services, and then summarize that and get a binary and put that binary along with all the other binaries. And now you have a sparse data set of binary data and look for the associations. You might even just say, well, I want four to be in the X group and one item in the Y group, but you can give me all the associations that predict any Y based on any group of four items on the left. And that would be a very open data mining task. Now, what about the persons in the household? So we might go to the employment 
of each individual in the household. And here we might get into the occupations of those people, which differ. So one person is perhaps doing housework in the home, another one is working as a teacher, and a third one is a cleaner. And you could have ordinal data about the occupations. So that's the area that I'm doing research on at the moment to expand the association rules analysis to allow for multiple adults and use ordinal methods on the sparse matrices. It's not that difficult because it's an established method in social science that we would use structural equation models. But structural equation models are not the same as association rules. The mathematics is very different. So be careful. Don't just mix them up. Uh, move deliberately across these methods. So there's question one, would you use regression? And question two is, would my data fit with association rules? But you kind of have to make it fit. Um, for example, you do have to get rid of your missing values, maybe convert them to zeros before you start the R package, A rules. And you may have to convert your data. So you could convert rupee money values into ratios, uh, the ratio of money spent on each thing. So it does get quite technical. And um, I can recommend chapter 12 of the textbook by Chapman and Fight. It's a good summary. I'll move on. Results from the USA Census. So the famous authors in this area are Breeze and Bryn. And Bryn, in, in 1997, gave results for the USA Census. So they were given access to individual records from the USA Census. And they ran an association rules research project to allow the employment pattern to be predicted by age and some other basic factors like veteran service, race, marital status. And certain rules did uh, uh, reach the top of the list when they measured lift. So that was summarized by Bryn and their team. And it was analyzed using the personal level. So it was not a transactions database. And sure enough, it was a sparse database and some of the rules were a little bit wacky. They didn't make sense in social science terms because things were so common. So if things are very, very common, they're just happening predominantly. And it's the, the very, very common occurrences are the equivalent mathematically of the very rare occurrences, okay? So they're harder to predict when they're very common and very rare. You have to be careful and maybe convert the data. So sure enough, they started cleaning and converting. In the UK, the census currently being released has data for 2021 at a low geographic level and not personal level. But you can merge all these data together. You append them as a wide database and each row is one locality. Very small localities are available, giving a large number of rows. So you could predict Y from X uh, with the, the same logic of association rules with the UK census. And this, this raises a philosophical debate. What's the first thing we should do here? Should we do the, the um, data mining or should we do regression? So many social scientists would look at the causality in the real world using a regression. And they would say the data reflects that reality containing traces of what happened. So that would allow for measurement error. That would be a realist approach. So realism is a associated with the idea of measurement error because we always allow for fallibility of the scholars. On the other hand, in data mining, there's a tendency to assume that the data is fine. The data is the data and we're predicting from the information in the data. So it's not realist. It's more empirically just driven by the data that we have. This actually is a fundamental philosophical difference. It's not so easy to resolve and it's not easy to assume no measurement error. So some people prefer the left-hand approach, especially if they think there is measurement error. So that's something I've written about in some of my um, detailed publications. Exploratory association methods usually do not claim causality. They say X is associated with Y, or X can predict Y, or the information in X can predict Y, you know, which is useful. And it's aiming at sort of immediate usefulness. So the input to the association is five to 50 columns of data, no social groups. And if it goes to 150 columns, you're getting into a large problem because of the number of permutations. So it's not the number of rows in your data set, but the number of possible permutations of the item sets. And the a priori algorithm was a solution developed in 1994 
for solving this. It makes the first path through the data, just looking at single items, and the second um, pass through the data is more limited by the information that's been obtained in the first pass about support. So the concept of support is defined as a mathematical concept, which makes it quicker to make two, three, four, five passes through the data, picking up bigger and bigger item sets. So the second pass looks for two item item sets. The third pass looks for three item item sets. And this has been explained by um, Brice and his colleagues, and also by the people who discovered this, which was Agarwal in 1994. And they offered the DIC algorithm as an alternative to that. And this DIC is sometimes used as a supplement um, to, to try and find a faster way through the data. So if your computer hangs, cancel. Don't let it hang and wait, just cancel your program and perhaps try a slightly different algorithm or an amendment to the data so that it'll run within a reasonable amount of time, like three minutes. Regression methods is different. We posit causality then test a hypothesis, but we know there is measurement error or the model might be the wrong model. So the results are not proving the hypothesis. So both schools of thought are very cautious and both of them really should be saying that we're testing hypotheses and not proving them. And then we move on, but the, the methods used are very different. So to go back to my India example, you can study the purchase of pearls and how it's predicted by household size and age. Um, older people are more likely to buy pearls and they give it as a gift to young people at the time of weddings. Um, so, so social groups matter to the purchasing system. This is the source of the India data. Currently it's eight years old data but we're hoping to see more data sets released by India for open access use. More recently, we have the National Family and Health Survey in India, which doesn't cover consumer purchases, but it's very recent, uh, 2122. And it's very good on showing which consumer segments have expenditure levels in each state, like by quintile, by decile. And then you can look at the quality of the house, the water supply. So it's similarly consumer segmentation. Should consumer expenditure data sets be put into the public domain? Yes. The government uses these to estimate gross domestic product, but other researchers can use them to make predictions, um, to benefit from the depth of detail. So yes, if possible, the governments could anonymize the data and then release them to the public and let us analyze those. So business and non-business would be analyzing them when they're released. Very often they're released with a restriction no commercial use. So academics are helpful if we analyze them and provide the summaries to the, the business community. So just a survey now to conclude, the main points I've made was that LIFT measures the co-association of two item sets. And an item set is a set of characteristics of the entities. It could be their spending, but it could be their jobs or some other household aspect. And confidence is a conditional probability of item set J based on the background info from item set I being purchased. And using conditional probability, we could convert the association rules into a regression with the probability of J item set being the dependent variable. I made some, a few pointers at the end to how consumer expenditure data is organized. I tried to help you with appending your variables, cleaning and appending the cases lengthwise, and then predicting Y from X. So I said that was a conditional probability Y given X, but that would then be perhaps item set X predicting item set Y. So for sets of characteristics Y, like using new services, we can use the basic employment pattern to make the prediction. So that's my summary. It, uh, it, it might've sounded all a bit abstract, so do try it. Um, this is Agarwal and Srikant is the people who discovered and developed the a priori algorithm, as well as the DIC algorithm, not the same as Bayesian DIC. And there are some current developments in this area, which I'm not covering here by Han. Tan gives a, a textbook style summary. Yun has new developments. Greece is cited here, Chapman and Fight is cited here, and R is cited here. So we thank everybody that contributes. Hasler in particular has been a great contributor along with their team members 
um, to the literature about A rules. It's been very, very helpful to have Hausler's thing. So thank you very much and bye-bye. It's Wendy Olson, Professor of Socioeconomics at Manchester University. If you have questions, send me an email, wendy.olson, O-L-S-E-N, at manchester.ac.uk. Bye.